when a believer dies, does he go straight to the presence of the Lord? Or does if somebody he... is not called, are they held responsible? Will the people who are involved on making these movies be in trouble on Judgment Day? If you commit suicide, will God forgive you for that sin? Welcome to Pastor's Perspective. If you've got a question about the Bible or Christian living, we want you to join the conversation. Call right now at 1-888-564-6173. That's 1-888-564-6173. Answering your question today is the Senior Pastor of Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, California, Brian Broderson, and author and apologist Don Stewart. Here now is your host, Josh Duransky. Thanks for tuning in to Pastor's Perspective. We would love to talk with you and answer your questions. The number is 888-564-6173. Call us up with your Bible questions or the questions you have about the Christian life. It's great to be with you. Hopefully you're having a good Thursday afternoon or evening wherever you are listening and tuning in. We do have Pastor Brian Broderson in studio with us. He's the pastor of Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa here in Southern California. And we also have in studio with us Don Stewart, who is an author, an apologist, a speaker. And you can read and find out more about Don on his website, educatingourworld.com. You can find us online and uh, interact with us on our Facebook page, which is uh, facebook.com slash pastors perspective. You can also watch the program live by going to kwve.com and or it's it's live streamed right on YouTube. That's what we're that's the platform that we live stream on. So mm-hmm. just uh, sign on to YouTube and search for pastors perspective. All right, so uh, here we are Thursday afternoon, Pastor Brian, Don, and uh, we're still here. Yep, no here rapture yet. <laughs> World hasn't melted down yet, and ready to answer. Uh, the hour's so. young, though. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So last night we looked at the the seventy seven year right. periods yeah. uh, mm-hmm. that Daniel was was given. You know, regarding the basically just the fulfillment of all prophecy and promises pertaining to Israel and the and the you know, coming uh, again of Christ. And next week we'll look at the the final chapter of Daniel, the 12th chapter. But, uh, you know, Don, looking at that and uh, thinking in terms of, um, you know, the people of the prince who will come will mm-hmm. destroy the city and the sanctuary. So the Romans destroy uh, Jerusalem in 70 AD. But then there's this prince that's referred to that's going to come. And then uh, the interesting thing though, there's a 2000 year, at least a 2000 yep. year gap between those two verses and that prince hasn't come yet, but that's a reference to the Antichrist. Yeah. And he's gonna, uh, he's gonna make a covenant with the nation. Uh, he's gonna make a covenant with many, and uh, many believe that that covenant will include the rebuilding of the temple, or uh, you know, the uh, the sacrifices are certainly going to be re- yeah. re-implemented at that point. And um, it just looks like the world is <laughs> just you know on on course to to come right to that destination <laughs> yeah it's it's set up for the isn't it interesting how everything is falling into place so miraculously just as the bible said and uh, yeah the uh, the time is ripe for all this to happen so stay tuned it's never a dull moment yeah. wow. but you know i was thinking about that um you know so we know the romans destroyed the city and the sanctuary Correct. so so in the future there's this this prince that's connected somehow to the romans yeah connected back to a, a European power, evidently. Mm-hmm. So yep. that's where the whole European Union comes into the picture and the interesting recent developments with the exiting of, of Britain right. and now kind of the scrambling of the European Union to sort of make sense of how to go forward. Looks like it all could uh, escalate here, huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's going to be a Gentile world ruler, revive the old Roman Empire, and from that, will um, the events will take place, as you know. Daniel twelve eleven says, uh, one thousand two hundred ninety days after he does this abomination of desolation, the kingdom of God comes to earth in the person yeah. of Christ. So yeah. wonderful. Yep, and that's what we're excited about. Yeah, we awesome. are. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So if people want to watch that sermon. They can go on uh, the church website, cccm dot com, and see what they missed. All right, let's go to uh, Nathan, who's calling from Ontario, California. Nathan, you're first up in this hour. How can we help you? Um, yeah, um, I've been married and divorced, and, and now I've, I plan on getting married again, but I've been fornicating with my my fiancé, and we have a daughter together, and 
And I was reading the Bible, and it was saying that, you know, no fornication will, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So am, am I not going to heaven now because I fornicated with this, this girl or what? Hmm. Pastor Brian. Uh, Nathan, it means that you need to get that right. Mm -hmm. It means that um, it's referring to those who just continue to practice the things that God has forbidden. So, um, you know, committing fornication doesn't keep you out of heaven, but uh, continuing to continuing to commit fornication uh, in kind of in the face of what God has said ab about that, then the way to resolve that is to get right get get married you know you like you said you've got you have a child um so don't uh, just kind of put it off like well you know one of these days we're going to get married um and if you're not if you decide you don't want to get married right now then quit sleeping together that's the i think you know those are your two options if you're going to follow jesus because jesus is going to require of us that we live a certain way and um sure you can break those rules but there's consequences to that and like i said if you just flat out ignore them or reject them then that you know what sends people to hell is not necessarily fornication what sends people to hell is the rejection of christ and to continue on in willful sin indicates that there's not a real submission to christ there so um it sounds to me like you know it sounds like you've given your life to the lord but it also sounds like you might um have a little bit of a problem with what God's word says. So God's word is always right. You can count, you can bet on that. So you want to conform to what God has said and not, uh, you know, not challenge that or expect God to, to sort of bend the rules for you. Nathan, so you can point back in your, your history and you kn know that you've given your life to Christ. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. So it's a matter of lining your life up with, with what you've confessed and said that you believe, right? Yeah, I believe. And just, you know, just keep me in prayer, you know. Now, what, is, it, is there something holding you back from just going down and getting married? I mean, that's a fairly simple yeah. thing to do these um, days, you know. There's finances. We'd like to have a halfway decent wedding. Well, listen, you can do all of that. You know, um, a lot of people do this. I have, I have done this myself. I've had people come into my office. They go down to the courthouse. They get a confidential wedding license. They come in in my office. We do a wedding. So they're married and the whole, you know, fornication issue, that's all dealt with. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, six months later or a year later when they can really, you know, get themselves together financially and all, then they might go ahead and have an, an actual wedding. So, um, you know, this is, a, this is a spiritual matter that you got to take care of mm -hmm. ASAP and uh, those other things are understandable, but you know, just trust God that as you get yourself right with Him, the other things are gonna they're gonna naturally come together for you in His time. All right, Nathan, thanks for calling. We appreciate it. Good, good question. Let's go to Gail calling from Riverside, California. Gail, you're on Pastor's perspective. Hi. Hi, Gail. It's very nice to talk, talk to you guys. I love your program, and God has used it um, to really speak to me many times. Well, great. Thank you, awesome. Gail. Um, my question is, um, I've heard a pastor say that people that heard about Jesus before the rapture are not going to really have a chance to accept Jesus after the rapture. And I was wondering what your perspective on that was. Yeah, Don, what, what do you think? Yeah, we, we don't believe it. The Bible doesn't teach that. In fact, uh, just the opposite. What we have during the Great Tribulation period are multitudes, un, un, unnamed, um, innumerable number of people there, the Tribulation saints who have been martyred for faith in Christ. They got to come from somewhere. And let's realize something, too, with the technology we have today. More and more people are hearing about Jesus. There aren't that many ignorant folks in the world today who've never heard the name of Jesus as opposed to a generation or two ago. So uh, what First Thess Second Thessalonians says in verse 12, it says, all of the ones not believing will be judged. But here's the key, the ones who take pleasure in unlawlessness and don't believe in the truth. In other words, they're, they're not just unbelievers here, the ones that are gonna get this a deceptive spirit, this deceptive uh, uh, power that's gonna come over. It's the ones he's speaking of who are basically take pleasure in sin. There's a lot of people who are sinners who are not taking pleasure in it or won't to the degree where they'll turn to Christ. The Bible doesn't teach that at all. There's some good people that believe it, but uh, uh, Scripture certainly doesn't teach as far as we're concerned. Hmm. 
Thanks, Gail, for the question. God bless. Let's go to Fathom calling from Oceanside, California. Fathom, you're on Pastor's Perspective. Hey, Fathom. Hi. 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 Thank you so much for taking my call. I've tried so many times to get through, and I always listen to you guys on my way to class to um, just, you know, fill me with truth. And I really just, I can't tell you how much this show has meant to me the past two years that That's I've um, been driving two hours every Thursday to class. So oh, wow. thank you so much. Well, we're glad that you made it through, yeah. and we're glad that we've been keeping you company for yeah. the past couple of years. That's yeah. awesome. Um, well, my question is, um, so I've been walking with Christ now for um, about the past five years, and I'm a military wife, and my husband and I used to watch this show called Long Island Medium, and um, my oldest daughter, she's 11, uh, she came to me one day and she told me, she's like, Mom, I don't think it's good that you watch this show, and so at first I was kind of like, well, okay, well, thank you for telling me, but then... I started listening to you guys' the show more, and I remember somebody talking about, you know, how we can't communicate after people have died. We can't talk with them after they've died. So then I started, you know, my spirit just started stirring up, and I was like, okay, Lord, what, what is this? Is this not right? Should I not be watching this? Is she not real? And so I really just wanted to get you guys' this perspective on mediums. And I don't know if you've ever watched Long Island Medium, but it just it seemed very like she was talking to other people's loved yeah. ones that have passed on. So yeah. I wanted to get your perspective. Yeah, that's a great question, Fathom. Thank you for asking. Pastor Brian, um, what would you say? Well, Fathom, yeah, this is something that the Bible is uh, pretty clear about. And it's... Um, you know, because mediums and so, you know, supposedly communicating with people that have died or whatever, uh, that's not a reality. If there, if there is some communication going on, it actually is with evil spirits who are impersonating the people that have, that have passed on. And so God is very clear that we're not to have intentional connection with uh, evil spirits. And back in the law of Moses, back in Leviticus, and also back in Deuteronomy, it spells that out. Let me read to you real quick from Deuteronomy 18. It says, there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, one who practices witchcraft or a soothsayer, one who interprets omens or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells or a medium or a spiritist or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving uh, the Canaanites out of the land. So this is what the Canaanites were doing. This is one of the things that got them uh, kicked out of the land and judged. And so as, as God's people, uh, you know, of course, the original message here was to the nation of Israel, but it, it obviously overflows to us in the church age as well. We're not to have any kind of a association with, with demons, at least any that we're, you know, in any kind of a pursuit of. So, so watching that program, watching that program is not going to hurt you necessarily, but it could kind of suck you in subtly to believing something that actually you don't want to be believing. So you've got to be mm -hmm. wise. And I think your daughter had uh, probably just a good word for you there. Yeah. Don? Yeah, yeah, I did a um, book on the occult in the early 80s. And there's a lot of study on that. And Fathom, almost every single one that practices these things, they're frauds. It's all parlor tricks. They're total frauds. There's really no supernatural involved. Now, not to say that in some cases this does happen, but the ones that are on TV, the famous ones, this and that, they're all frauds. In fact, there is a, a guy that wrote a book in the 80s called The Psychic Mafia, where he sort of unveiled all that and sort of spilled the beans, as it were, and, and, and you know, shared some of their tricks. And that was, it was actually fascinating. But he, he, he said they're just a mafia there. They all share with one another because the same people end up going to these these <laughs> folks. And so they share, share, share with, the story. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so they're, they're we're waiting for him, but it was it was fascinating. Mm. But no, you don't want to watch it anyway because you don't because it does open people up, and people may like Brian said, uh, uh, according to what God's word says, don't learn the way of the heathen. That is not not something you ought to get into. Mm. Fathom, thanks for calling us. Appreciate the question. Uh, let's go to Carol calling from Riverside, California. Carol, you're on Pastor's Perspective. Hi. Hi. Uh, I was listening to one of your teachers on KWA one morning, this is about a few weeks ago, and he said that the number of people who will be saved 
will equal the number of angels that fell with Satan. And I wanted to know where that is specifically in Scripture. And before he said that, he read Romans eleven twenty five. He was preaching on end-time prophecy. And he also said that God is replicating what happened in Eden. So okay. I want to know if that's true. And if so, where is that in Scripture? Mm -hmm. Okay, Don, we'll start with you. Yeah, okay, uh, Brian, why did you say that? <laughs> I'm sorry about well, it. part of my new book. Couldn't you know, resist but... that. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, I yeah. do. I remember the the yeah. teacher because some, this question has already come up, yeah. and uh, yeah. So it's a perspective that we wouldn't necessarily agree with. No. It's not a no. major doctrinal issue, you know. Like you would say, well, gosh, if that guy's teaching that, we got to yeah. throw him off the radio. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's just when it comes to some of these things, there are occasions when people will they'll they'll speculate a little bit because mm. the scripture's silent. And they'll say, well, you know, maybe this happened or that it could have been like that. Well, probably the better rule is if the scripture's silent, probably better to be silent ourselves <laughs> rather yeah. than mm -hmm. get off and theorizing about things that, uh, you know, could or could not be, but we don't know. So, uh, yeah. So what it, I, I remember vaguely that, that this came up, um, but I... Of course, Don, just the whole idea that the yeah. equal, you know, equal number of people are going to be saved to replace the angels who fell. The idea was that yeah. God has, you know, sort of a specific number. And of course, that's not, there's nothing in the Bible to indicate that. Yeah, not only that, um, we don't replace angels. Angels are a different type of being. Hebrews 1, 7, 14 says they're set, they're ministering spirits sent to minister to those who are heirs of salvation. Uh, they were created for that purpose. And the fact that some of them fell, which we have no idea what the number is. Now, I guess theoretically it could be the same number. But the Bible certainly doesn't limit that or say it, say it that way. And here's the problem, Brian, as we've talked about before. When you go beyond what the scriptures mm -hmm. say, therein lies the danger. Paul says to the Corinthians, don't go beyond that which is written. We got to be so careful, mm -hmm. don't we? Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Now, our immense research staff has passed along a note to me saying that this was taught as not an absolute, but as a possibility. So, <laughs> yes, it was, it was put out there as a speculation. Yeah. Um, okay. So... All right. Thank you, Carol, for the call. We appreciate that. Let's go to Shantri calling from Roanoke, Virginia. Shantri, you're on Pastor's Perspective. Hi, how are you today? Good, how are you? I'm doing well. Good, thanks for calling us. So my question is a little bit strange, but um, <laughs> when Jesus was on earth for his 30 feet, three years as a man, how did he view time? Was it linear or was it omnipotent mm. as if he was still God? Yeah, that's a good question, uh, Pastor Brian. Hebrews, uh, Hebrews. I'm sorry. Uh, Philippians chapter two tells us that who, being in the form of God, did not uh, consider it something to be grasped to, uh, you know, uh, maintain equality with God. But he, but he uh, humbled himself. He set aside. He didn't set aside his deity, but he set aside his prerogatives in a sense as. God and one of those prerogatives would have been his um, his omniscience at the time, and so we have to remember Jesus came; he was a man. So we're we're living in a linear linear situation. He was right in the exact same situation that we are in. Hmm. Shantri, thank you for the call. It's a good question, actually. In fact, it was a big part of the debate in the early church, right? Over, and that was the first uh, council was over the nature of Jesus and is how do we reconcile his deity with his humanity? Mm -hmm. So again, Chantry, thank you for the call. Let's go to Daniel calling from Solana Beach, California. Daniel, you're on Pastor's Perspective. Hey guys, um, I had a uh, question concerning um, being chosen and how people are saved because um, it's been kind of boggling me ever since I started really thinking about it. Now I can't get my mind off of it. Um, this last few years um, that I've been, I rededicated my life to Christ. Uh, the Lord has blessed me with being able to uh, partake in leading people to Christ. And they were uh, just professions of faith. And I didn't really get to disciple much, but um, it seemed like they were almost like holy appointments. I wasn't knocking on doors. I wasn't waiting on the streets. I was just uh, friends or um, employees or things like that. And um, it's strange because when I led them to Christ, 
it didn't take much. It was just, I showed them some scriptures and, you know, they had a few questions and it was like, they were just ready. And, um, and they came to the Lord and. Right. So is that your, that's the premise of your question. Are we either lost as audio? Why don't we go to you, Don? What would you say? Yeah, uh, there's no such thing, Daniel, in Scripture as individual, shall we say, predestination to salvation or damnation. You never find that taught. We're predestined, according to Romans eight twenty nine to be conformed to the image of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1, our goal is to be the praise of the, to the glory. He has selected us from the foundation of the world so we can be holy and blameless in his sight. And so the idea of individual predestination to salvation salvation or damnation. We don't believe it's taught in the Bible at all. We believe God has given people choice. In fact, from the beginning of the scripture to the end, there's an assumption there that humans actually have legitimate choice. You've got Joshua telling the people, choose this day who you will serve. Elijah and the prophets of Baal, if Baal be God, serve him. If the Lord be God, serve him. Jesus weeping over the city of Jerusalem, then saying, hey, how often I wanted to gather you as a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you weren't willing. Well, that seems to mean they could have been willing. And over and over again, from beginning to end, there's the assumption we have choice. And so if if we don't have choice, if we really don't, there's no legitimate choice, then Jesus weeping, his crying, his, you know, his uh, lament over Jerusalem be a charade because he would have known everything was 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 worked out ahead of time, but it's not. And, and Brian, one of the things... We, we can't, I guess we can't stress enough is people are going to be held personally responsible for what they do. They can't fall back and say, well, look, God didn't choose me or, or God did choose me. Therefore, I'm, I'm in or I'm out. It doesn't work that way, does it? <laughs> no, it doesn't. But if you, if you buy into that idea and if you take it to its logical conclusion, then that really does sort of mean that you, how could you be held accountable if you were already predestined to go a certain way anyway? Exactly. Right? Yeah. So yeah, the scripture teaches human accountability and the only way for that is that there actually yeah. has to be a choice exactly. that men are able to make and but in the end you know i i'd like to take it back i i think when it comes down to the whole thing of you know god uh you know it says in it says in romans 9 uh it is not of um him who wills or him who right. runs but god who shows mercy and so what does that mean? It's not of him who wills. Well, I like to take it all the way back to salvation itself. Salvation only is available because God offered it. God was under no obligation to offer salvation to anybody. So in the end, yes, salvation is absolutely 100% of the Lord. He's the one who offered it to us, but he offered it under the condition that we believe. <laughs> so yeah. if we don't believe, then we don't get it. But um, it wasn't our will that that brought salvation into being. It was God's will. Mm. Daniel, thank you for the call. We appreciate that question. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to Pastor's Perspective. We're answering your Bible questions on air. We've got in studio with us today, Pastor Brian Broderson of Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa and Don Stewart. Uh, the number you can call is 888-564-6173 if you want to be a part of today's program. Uh, let's go next to Aaron calling from New Orleans, Louisiana. Aaron, you're on Pastor's Perspective. Uh, hi guys. Um, hi, Aaron. First time ever listening to your uh, your program here. I, I I've got a good radio station down here, uh, Freedom Radio. Listen to them. And That's great. I don't happen to be driving when I catch you guys uh, when you guys are on. So wonderful. Uh, well, we're glad program. you're tuning in. Uh, I just wanted to piggyback on the um, question the young lady had uh, yeah. brought up a couple callers ago. Um, it was always my uh, my point of view, uh, like you guys said, that uh, people aren't on able to call up the dead, that it would be evil spirits. Um, as I was explaining when I called in um, and spoke to the screener, um, you know, I understand that there is, you know, hyperbole in the Bible. I mean, for example, you know, is it truly easier for a rich man to enter to the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle? But, uh, you know, I think that uh, for the most part, uh, my wife and I tend to be people who I guess are, are pretty literal, you know, in the, in the, in the way that we believe the word. Mm -hmm. sure. And, uh, you know, we read every night to our children and we've gone through the Bible. Um, uh, my oldest is 11, I'd say at least four or five times. So we've read, you know, we've read the stories of, um, of, of Saul and Samuel and David over and over again. And, um, you know, my, my question, uh, ultimately is, uh, you know, the, the, the story where, where Saul, he goes after Samuel has died, and he finds this uh, this spirit, this, this medium, and she calls up Samuel from the dead, and, and up comes Samuel, and and he uh, he tells Saul that he's going to die, that his kids are going to die. I think he tells him that too, but you're going to die. 
mm-hmm. and this battle, and why did you call me up? Why are you bothering me? And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I know the word doesn't tell us everything, but certainly uh, not mm-hmm. every story gives us, you know, every tiny little detail right. about what's, what's going on. But uh, I guess I would have this expectation that we would maybe be told that uh, the Spirit didn't actually call up Samuel, that mm-hmm. maybe she was speaking with an evil spirit. So I just kind of wonder what you guys think about that. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So he's following up on the question that we had about the mediums earlier uh, in the hour. And uh, Don, one of the things that you had said was that a lot of these people are frauds. Correct. And so he's pointing to the uh, this incident with Samuel being called up by this medium. What what do you think, and how does that reconcile with what you were saying earlier? A, a couple of things. Number one, it was Samuel five times in the context it says, but this was God that brought up Samuel, not the medium. If you remember, the medium was shocked uh, that that Samuel showed up because <laughs> the medium was probably a fraud, uh, you know, and so uh, you know was going to do some <laughs> hocus pocus there with Saul, and all of a sudden here comes the real Samuel showing up, and she was she was shocked. And so. This, yeah. is, this is an exception, you know, what God did, he's brought Samuel up, who was a prophet who prophesied Saul's death, and Saul died the next day, and uh, they recognized it was him, and, and it was, so this was an interesting situation, because Saul had, uh, God had stopped talking to Saul, and Saul had made a command that no, you know, there should be no mediums in Israel, this, this was the exception there, she was still practicing, and it led to, Saul heard from the man of God that he was going to die the next mm-hmm. day, so this doesn't, this is not the same thing what we're talking about, this is not a medium call calling someone up. This is God supernaturally intervening when the medium was going to, you know, probably throw some fraud on Saul. And yet uh, God intervened and told uh, Saul, you know, you're going to be with Samuel in the next world the next day. Well, Aaron, thanks for that follow-up question. We appreciate it. It does really apply to the question we were uh, answering earlier. Yeah, I'm glad we're... uh, Yeah. ...being listened to in New Orleans. That's great. (laughs) That's so awesome. Yeah, it's great. All right, let's go to Lynn calling from Vista, California. Lynn, you're on Pastor's Perspective. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, I wanted to know about halos. You know, we always see pictures of angels with halos, and then, mm-hmm. you know, like other religions put them on different people to show they're holy. But um, what is the purpose of a halo, and are angels the only ones who have them? Good question. Pastor Brown. Uh, no, this is just an artist <laughs> attempt to, you know, designate the the special person in the um, scene. You know, so here you've got, you know, you've got five people, and one of them is Jesus. They all kind of look similar, but one of them has a halo. So, oh well, that that must be Jesus right there. Uh, so yeah, it has nothing to do with any any reality. There's nothing in the Bible that says you know any of the. Old Testament saints or New Testament saints, for that matter, had any kind of uh, supernatural glow or indication uh, about them. As a matter of fact, uh, Isaiah 53, remember talking about Jesus, it says there was nothing uh, visibly about his form. There was nothing that distinguished him from anybody else. He wasn't extremely attractive or, or any of that. So, no, this is just an artistic thing. Yeah, Don, what else? Yeah, it's an interesting story. Um, James Randi, he's still alive, but he's, I don't know if he's practicing anymore. He would uh, challenge these paranormal claims. There was this one person that said they could see actually halos and energy above people's head. They actually could see it. <laughs> he said, really? Oh, yeah, we, I see it. I can, I, can, I can see where it is. He said, okay, let's test it out. I'm going to put a ledge about 100 miles, 100 miles, 100 feet long, and I'm going to stand behind it where you can't see where I'm at. So you're going to have to tell me exactly where my halo is, right? You can do that? And the guy wouldn't do it. You know, <laughs> He could see it, but once you're you're hiding behind the, the ledge, you know, the halo, you know, for some reason, <laughs> I guess like Superman couldn't see lead through or see through lead or something. So the point is, no, this, it's again more fraud. You don't, yeah. it doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting symbol. Do you know um, the history? I'd love to... Maybe uh, when I have some free time. The halo? the halo, yeah. When did that come into art, become popular in art? Yeah, it pro- pro- well, it's probably with the gold leaf. If I remember my art history, the um, it was the Renaissance, if not mistaken, about mm-hmm. or the, the high Renaissance, the Reformation period, when they started doing the gold leaf over the people who were the biblical characters. They wanted yeah. to, you know, make them distinct and stand out. So the halo was the, mm. the creator, at least the, the glow there, and it became a halo, if I'm not mistaken there. Wow, interesting. Yeah. Well, Lynn, thanks for that question. We're going to take a break real quick. We'll be back in just a second to answer more of your questions. Well, thanks for tuning in. It's great to be with you. Today, we are going to be in studio for an extra hour answering your questions. We'll be recording a second program. 
It'll air at a later date, so uh, you've got twice as much time to call in. We'd love to hear from you. The number is 888-564-6173. And uh, if you can't get through the first time, keep trying. The lines do clear out as we get into the next hour. And so, uh, yep, we will be here, and we would love to have your questions as a part of that program. All right, uh, we've got Pastor Brian Brutterson in studio with us here. He's the pastor of Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa, as well as Don Stewart, and uh, they're answering your Bible questions. Uh, let's go next to Donna calling from Orange, California. Donna, you're on Pastor's Perspective. Hi, Pastors. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Sure. I'm calling in regards to a marriage and divorce question, um, specifically Matthew 532, where it says, um, but I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife except for the reason of unchastity makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And um, kind of my history, I was married for 20 years. Um, my husband was unfaithful to me, not just once, but he had a eight-month relationship with a woman. Um, we ended up divorcing. Um, I was single for about five years, and then I met another uh, wonderful Christian man who I ended up marrying after two and a half years of dating. Um, we've been married for almost five years coming up in October, um, but for two of those five years, we've been separated, including right now. Um, and he's filed for divorce. Um, neither one of us has been unfaithful. Um, during our relationship, basically every time we would get in a fight, probably once a month, he would threaten divorce. Uh, initially, I was, you know, oh, no, please don't, let's work it out. But eventually, I just said, you know, if that's what you feel you need to do. Um, so my question is, um, when I get divorced this time, where where does that leave me as far as now if I move into another relationship, am I committing adultery? Should I not remarry? I'm just kind of confused as to um, what my future is. Um, and although I'm not perfect, I, I just want to honor God in everything that I do. So I was hoping you guys could clarify where that leaves me. Mm -hmm. Sure. Pastor Brian. Yeah, those are uh, deep, deep questions, Donna. And, um, you know, from just the way you described it, uh, it sounds like that if this current marriage is ending in divorce, it's ending in divorce because there's not a willingness to reconcile and to work through the issues on, on the part of your husband. Is that right? Is that, is that what's going on? Um, my current husband, um, he moved out and purchased another home about a year ago. And then four months later, he, about eight months ago, then four months after that, he filed for divorce. And he said he doesn't really want a divorce. He's just doing that to basically force me into um, moving with him. And the reason I haven't moved with him and given up my home um, is because he constantly threatens for divorce. So I'm worried that mm -hmm. if I agree in moving with him and I'm in his home, yeah. then where does that leave me when he wants to leave? So he said he doesn't necessarily want a divorce. He just mm -hmm. thinks that's the only thing that will force me into that position. Now, you, you said that he's a Christian? Correct. And what... I mean, what what is the proof in his life that he's a Christian? Just he goes to church, but he, he ignores what the Bible teaches about uh, his his role as a husband and his obligation to you and so forth. I mean, this is not the kind of stuff a Christian husband normally would do. That's why I'm saying that. Yeah. Yeah. So you you agree with that? I agree. I mean, there's a lot of other aspects in his life that just, you know, show that he honors God, but it's kind of pick and choose, I guess, based on yeah. on what's convenient for him. And um, I just am concerned now, um, moving forward with the divorce, it'll be finalized in October if it goes through. And I'm willing to stay in the marriage, even if we're separated. I mean, to me, the only biblical reason for divorce is, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, infidelity. Um, so I understand no marriage is perfect. Sometimes people yeah. don't get along. Um, but I just wonder moving forward, yeah. am I now to stay single and not remarry? Does that yeah. make me an adulteress if I do? No, the, the passage that you initially referred to, Matthew 5.32, Jesus is actually, um, you know, he's really putting the 
um, the burden on the uh, the man who's forcing the the woman into an adulterous situation. She, I don't think that Jesus is saying that the woman is is actually literally committing adultery and going to be judged for it. I think what he's trying to show the man is that he's not only responsible for his own sins, but he's making he's putting somebody else in a position where they have no other choice. Uh, and they, they're going to bear the brunt of that as well. I think he's kind of laying it like a double judgment on the men there. Um, in your situation, I, I mean, obviously this is a, it's a very personal one and it's one you have to pray through. But look, you know, if, you're, if your husband is going to divorce you or, go, I mean, this is a very manipulative kind of a situation you just described here. So if he's going to uh, try to manipulate you and if, if you're not manipulated, he's going to divorce you, then um, you know you, uh, you. I I personally would think that you're you don't have to be bound in that situation, and you just move on with the Lord. Well, he's going to do what he's going to do. If he's going to divorce you, he's going to divorce you, and then you move on with the Lord, and God will show you as as you move forward. You know, uh, Jesus, of course, he was talking in a certain context, and he did say that um, adultery, you know, unfaithfulness was the basis for divorce. And but yet, as we we've got to take the whole picture of Scripture and not just one verse of Scripture, or even two or three. We've got to take the whole, the the totality of what the Scripture says on this. And Paul says in First Corinthians chapter seven, he's talking about the believer and the unbeliever being married. Now I know he, he says he's a believer, but he's not behaving like a believer. And he says, if the unbeliever depart, let him depart. You're you're not bound under such circumstances. So it sounds sounds to me like he's going to get out of this marriage or he's going to try to manipulate things along and if he does that then let him depart you're not bound under those circumstances the 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 burden will fall on him in the end not on you Mm. thanks for the call donna we appreciate it let's go to uh rose calling from nuevo california rose you're on pastor's perspective hi my name is rose and i'm from nuevo and my question is um, I recently found Christ, but, um, and so I've been going to a biblical Christian church, and um, I was raised Mormon, so I always thought I knew Jesus, but mm. um, I didn't ever know that there were such huge doctrinal differences. And mm. um, my question is, um, do, like, would biblical Christianity believe that the Mormon people are saved? So, so that's your question. Would would Christians believe that would, Mormons are saved? Yeah. Yeah, I guess they, like in Mormonism, my main concern would be for my family. Yeah. Right. Um, because yeah, you know that's the big draw to Mormonism. Yeah. The whole family lives together for eternity. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Don, but I'm going to come back to you in a second. But I want to ask Rose a question first. Rose, so you were raised a Mormon. Uh-huh. You've you've now received Christ. Would you say you were a Christian before you received Christ like you have now as a Mormon? Because you said as a Mormon, you believed in Jesus. So what's, um, what's happened since between now and then? Uh, what's the difference? Um, I would say that now I know, I mean, I'm still very new in my faith, but I, I know who Jesus really is. And, yeah. um, you know, Mormon is a very complicated religion. You have mm-hmm. to really be taught a lot to understand it. But um, yeah. Jesus is very different yeah. um, in in the Christian religion, and I've never worshipped Jesus. I mm-hmm. feel like now I just feel like mm-hmm. God's grace abounding upon my life versus always feeling like I could never be good enough. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's a great yeah, that's a great <laughs> description there, Don. Yeah, welcome to the family, Rose. Glad to, glad you really found the real Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 11, in Paul's day, he talked about a false Jesus, false apostles that were there, that a Jesus that didn't exist, that was proclaimed, and that's the Mormon Jesus. You found the real Jesus. The Mormon Jesus is not the real Jesus. The Mormon God is not the real God. I don't know if you discovered the God you were worshiping. Uh, the God of this planet was once a man who lived a righteous life, died, resurrected. Now, Mormons are worshiping him, Elohim, who was a human being once. And you've got Jesus now, the spirit brother of Lucifer. And so you've got all these different things. Joseph Smith, History of the Church, 119. He waved his hand as uh, as supposedly a divine being spoke to him. When he asked which church to join, he was told he should join none of them because they were all wrong. All the people were corrupt. They draw nearer to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, from me uh, preaching the doctrines of men uh, rather than the commandments of God. So Joseph supposedly got this 
this new revelation, the re- you know, the restored gospel. It's been lost for 18 centuries. He's restored it. And it's a different Jesus, different gospel. So no, Mormons are not believing in the God of the Bible. They reject every major doctrine, the, the, the deity of Christ, the doctrine of the Trinity, who God is, uh, how salvation is by grace through faith, not of work. So no, they are believing. You were believing like you, you've testified in a different Jesus. So the Mormon Jesus is not the same as the Jesus of the Bible. It's just that cut and dried. Yeah. I think she, you know, in her own description, like you're saying, Don, just by... said uh, perfectly. Yeah. I I I want to go back to Rose for a second. Uh, Rose, I want to ask you another question. Um, Uh So when you were a Mormon, did you... Uh Did you understand all the stuff that Don just said? Did you understand Elohim was once a man who is now God? Did you ever hear about Jesus being the half brother of Lucifer? All of that. Yeah, Did yeah. You? No, okay. I was taught that, and um, and yeah. but it's weird because they say they believe the Bible too. So yeah, as a right. Mormon, yeah. you believe you have the fullness of the truth, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. and you think that you're Christian, but you're mm-hmm. extra Christian. Like when I first came mm-hmm. to um, Jesus in a Christian church, I was thinking, well, I'm extra saved. I yeah, exactly. And I know Jesus, and <laughs> I would talk, and I would think like, "Well, my family is fine," and that is my main concern. Is yeah. my heart is for my family, who yeah. Yeah. Um, you know thinks that I've fallen away and that oh, yeah. I'm lost, and yeah. um, you yeah. know they are very. It's I'm I've heard people say the word cult, and as I've been researching, I now I realize that yes, it is a cult because the church teaches them yeah. that if I oppose their teachings, that they need to cut ties with me so yep. i i feel mm-hmm. very strongly but then i just try to hope in my mind that mm-hmm. you know yeah. they're okay because they don't think they'll listen to me yeah. yeah well here here's the thing we just want to encourage you you know you mm-hmm. i mean who you probably never would have thought that you would be where you're at right now and talking yeah. to us about this. Yeah. So so just yeah. know that God can reach them just like he reached you. And you just keep mm-hmm. following Jesus, keep loving your family, keep praying for them. And, um, you know, you hopefully you'll have those moments where you can speak the truth to them about what you've come to discover now uh, about yeah. Jesus and maybe they'll open up. But, you know, um, these things kind of take time to develop. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes it takes even years where they they watch your life and they realize that, wow, you know, she, she really does have something. And by your, like you even said, you've got something now, you're worshiping Jesus. You've got an experience with him that you didn't have previously. Mm-hmm. And that yeah. could be the very thing that uh, they see and that mm-hmm. perhaps would draw them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I hope so. Well, yeah. well, thank you so much. All mm-hmm. right. Thanks thank for calling. You, Bless your heart. Rose. Appreciate that. Thanks. Uh, awesome. Good question. All right, let's go to Lindsay calling from West Berlin, New Jersey. Lindsay, you're on Pastor's Perspective. Hi, thank you. Yeah. I have kind of two questions. Um, I read an article that made me think of these. So um, basically, is it true that the Bible teaches that the origin of the need for clothes comes from the need to sacrifice, shed blood, atone for, and cover our shame that comes from sin? And to go along with that, is it possible for a Christian woman to be right in her heart with God and still wear a bikini? Or is she, in essence, saying, I'm proud of the shame that my sin brings? Mm. Interesting mm-hmm. application. Mm. Uh, Pastor Brian. Well, she just needs to keep the bikini on and everything's fine. <laughs> 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 if she insists on not wearing the bikini, yeah. that's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> no, the, so, you know, we, we read in the creation story that God creates um, Adam and Eve. He creates male and female. And initially, obviously, there, there's no sin. They're created pure. They're created perfect. And they're naked. There's no need to uh, for any covering or anything like that. They're in a perfect environment and so forth. Then sin comes in and suddenly they become conscious of their nakedness and they hide themselves from God because they are naked. So they realize that something has changed, something's happened. And ever since that time, uh, everybody who has a mind that has any sensitivity to the spirit of God recognizes you just, nakedness is something that is to be covered. And so, but there was a, a larger 
a spiritual matter there as well. It wasn't just, you know, that they needed skins to cover their physical nakedness. It was now they were exposed. Their sin was there open and exposed before God. And the real, the major shame was the sin. And the reason the animals were slain was to provide blood to cover for the sin because atonement needed to be made. But then the skins provided for the the physical covering as well. So um, it just, it's one of the ways of understanding that, um, you know, God has placed in our heart a, a moral standard. And part of that is that we, wearing clothes is not something that we just sort of accidentally stumbled on. It's something that we've been doing from the very beginning to hide our uh, certain, you know, private areas. And that's, that's absolutely biblical. Now, there are lots of people in the world today that think that's ridiculous. And the more you get closer to nature and discover who we really are, that we're all just evolved and, you know, take off your clothes and everybody ought to be nudist. And um, that's a worldview that's contrary to the biblical worldview. Mm -hmm. But it, it doesn't really apply in regard to your bikini or anybody else's for that matter. Lindsay, that's, that's Genesis chapter three. So uh, if you want to if if you say because you said you this came up as you were reading an article, so if you didn't happen to know where Pastor Brian was talking from, go read Genesis one, two, and three. You'll see that story play out. All right, let's go to Alexis calling from Seaside Heights, New Jersey. Alexis, you're on Pastor's perspective. Hi, Pastors. Um, Hi. Thank you for taking my call, and I want to tell you guys, God bless you so much for doing this work because you seriously take the time to answer these questions and give people clarity and I am seriously thankful for it because I listen to you guys faithfully every day. <laughs> that's great. great. Well, Thank we're you. Wonderful. We're <laughs> delighted to know that, Alexis. That's great. <laughs> um, but I heard you speaking to another woman. I apologize for the noise. I'm in Walmart right now. Um, <laughs> we'll forgive you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> At least you went in Target. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a little concerned with their bathroom agenda. Yeah. So yeah. That's yeah. Why I said that. as a woman, um, we would you totally, totally understand, understand that. Yeah, we get that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but my question is, I heard you speaking to another woman previously, and she mentioned that her and her friend were baptized on the same day. They came to know Christ around the same time. Right. And um, you offered her the advice of asking the friend to pray with her, read the Bible with her, and all that. Um, my husband and I are in a similar situation. We came to know Christ at the same time. We were baptized the same day. We were married the following day. Whoa. Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, and, well, we had been together for a few years before that. Oh, okay. And then once we came to find Christ, we were like, okay, we don't want to have sex out of wedlock or anything like that. So... We thought the right thing to do would be to get married. Um, we now have a 10-month-old son. Mm -hmm. And my question is, I asked him to pray with me and to read the Bible with me, do Bible study, and he always seems to push it off. But he swears up and down that he's a man of God. He wants to follow God. He wants to um, do everything that God tells him to do, and that's why he doesn't do certain things, but I see a different light in him all the time, where he threatens me with divorce, or he'll find another woman to be with, even if we're still together. Um, he threatens he, you with that? He threatens yeah. you that he's going to find another woman? Okay. Hmm. Um, he does not work, and says that because he worked for, I don't know, what was it, like six months, I think at the most, that it's my time to step up and start working and all these other things. And a lot of my family wants me to leave. But I feel as though that, um, you know, I'm, I'm a Bible believer as well. And I believe that what God says is true. Oh, please excuse him. <laughs> um, that I feel as though, um, you know, what God put together, no man should separate. And also if no either party is being um, unfaithful that there really is no grounds mm -hmm. for divorce. Mm -hmm. But I also feel as though I deserve much more than this. Yeah. And I don't know where I stand right now. And Well, let me, let me jump in, Alexis. Yeah. And um, Pastor Brian, you, do you want to respond to her? We haven't gotten to get Donna here in yeah, yeah, on yeah. many of these questions. Donna, yeah. do you have any initial thoughts? Yeah, separate. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. separate is not the same as divorce. If he's threatening those kind of things, yeah. would you yeah. agree, Brian, that, that you yeah. got to do that? Yeah, and you know, not working, exactly. and I'm going to yeah. go find another woman. No, no. I mean, you know, this is not the sign of a person nope. who's had a, a rebirth of the spirit. You know, when your person is saved, when a person is born again, mm-hmm. there's a, a, a change of heart. It doesn't mean that you're perfect, but there are obviously going to be signs there where you're going to want to obey God, you're going to want to love your wife. The Bible says husbands love your wives. And so it doesn't sound like there's a real, any kind of a real spiritual life that's developed in him. Where listening to you, Alexis, it's obvious that God has you know, genuinely touched your heart. So um, you don't have to live on in a, in a situation like this no. where he eventually decides, well, yeah. I told you I was going to go find another woman, yeah. and now he does, and yeah. then there you are. You know, you're yeah. the mm-hmm. victim of that kind of a situation. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. this might be a time to listen to your family. Yep. And like Don said, right, to yeah. separate That's not divorce. and say, hey, yep. you know, you need to get your life together mm-hmm. with God. Mm-hmm. I need you to be a godly husband, exactly. not a, you know, a loser. And um, put the ball back in his court. Yeah, unfortunately, in the church, uh, being in the church, and you guys have been in the church much longer than I have, but we, you do come across men more often than women who kind of know the importance of marriage and the um, restrictions on divorce from a biblical perspective and use those things oh, yes. to be abusive towards yeah, the wife and to say, uh, you know, uh, I've repented of my sin. I asked for your forgiveness, so therefore you have to stay with me yeah. um, or you know, kind of yeah. bizarre behavior that, yeah. that a Christian really wouldn't. Or, or they behave badly and then they uh, they kind of force the woman into a situation where she's got to like, man, I got to get out of here. And then it's like, oh, well, you're divorcing me. You know, God right. says not divorce. So you're the, you know, they try to, Make them the guilty party when actual yeah. and when in actuality they're they're the victims and this is just a manipulative ploy. Yeah, that person does exist out there. So Alexis, th- this is where on these kind of things, having being a part of a local church, yeah. having yeah. pastors that you can go to and talk these things through more than just for five minutes, you know, on the mm-hmm. phone, is so important. That's yeah. that's why the local church and, is so valuable. And Alexis, um, that would uh, mm-hmm. take you know see if you can get. Your husband, maybe if you guys have a local church, go in and sit down and talk to the pastor and just tell him, hey, this is what's going on in our lives. And, you know, he needs to be spoken to very straightly. And maybe he's not going to receive it from you. But maybe if somebody else looks him in the eye and says, hey, listen, you know, don't fool yourself. You're not really uh, you're not really a Christian based upon your behavior. So mm-hmm. let's, uh, you, know, you need to get your life right. So hopefully you've got an opportunity there with the local church to do that. All right. Well, Alexis, thanks for calling us. We appreciate you being a listener out there yeah. and uh, say hi to your ch- little child yeah. there with you as well. All right, man, we're going to go into, yeah, what are we going to add? We got to get a one minute gospel presentation in here because we just have a couple seconds and to go. And we're playing too, right? That's right. Yeah, I want to remind people we'll be back for a second hour, but uh, let's share the gospel. We have, we've got 90 seconds. Oh, that's plenty of time. It's real simple. Uh, the thief on the cross said to Jesus, "What my, you know, uh, Lord, remember me. <laughs> yeah. And Jesus said, today, you're going to be with me in paradise. If you're out there, you don't know Jesus Christ as your savior. It's real simple. In your own words, the best way you know how to say, Lord, remember me. I want to know you in a personal way. I want my sins mm-hmm. to give and I want to know I'm going to heaven. Just that simple, isn't it, Brian? Isn't it? Yep. And, you know, I think of how um, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's as simple as it can get. You just say, Jesus. And if you mean that genuinely from your heart, Jesus, I want you to save me. Wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, wherever you've been, he will do that very thing. He'll come in and he'll save you. He'll take your life and he'll turn it around and he'll make something beautiful out of it. Amen. Well, we appreciate you listening in during this hour. And if you missed any part of the show, we'd encourage you to go back, listen to the podcast. You can share that online as well with your friends and family, Uh, share it to social media. Uh, That's uh, always a blessing for us and helps us extend the ministry in a real practical way. Uh, Search for it on your favorite podcasting app, Pastor's Perspective. You can also find the video version of the program by going to YouTube and searching for Pastor's 
perspective. Uh, joining me in studio today has been Pastor Brian Broderson of Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. He is a pastor here in Southern California, and you can watch his most recent studies in the book of Revelation and Daniel by going to cccm.com. He's also been teaching through the book of Psalms on Sunday morning. Also joining us in studio is Don Stewart, who is an apologist, an author, and speaker. His website is educatingourworld.com. Don, you have written a, a number of books, and those are all available on your site. They are such a, a blessing. They're not only available as print, that they're also ebooks that you can get on Kindle or iBooks. And uh, so check that out through Don's website. Our um, home station here, our flagship station is kwve.com and that's where the live stream can always be found. And uh, if you want to reach us through our Facebook page, that's facebook.com slash pastor's perspective. There's a little message button there. If you want to ask us a question, click that, send us a message, and uh, that's a great way to get a hold of us as well. Again, we're going to be in studio for another hour answering your questions. So if you can't get through here in the next couple of minutes, try us again. The number is 888-564-6173. Have a blessed evening. We'll be back tomorrow. You've been listening to Pastor's Perspective. We're here every weekday answering your questions on Christian living, the Bible, just about any subject. Join us next time and follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash pastor's perspective. The preceding was sponsored by Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, California.